The peptide stack known as GLOW has been gaining a lot of popularity in recent times and it contains BPC-157, TB-500 and GHKCU and I've extensively covered all three of these so in this video I'm going to talk about the potential synergy as well as risks too and so I'll go into things to watch out for, ways to mitigate that as well as look at some anecdotal reports on faster healing. So to give you an overview, as you might know, BPC-157 can support local angiogenesis, the formation of new blood vessels, as well as growth factor signaling. Then you've got the TB-500 that can come in and uh, increase cell migration and matrix remodeling. And then you've got the GHKCU, of course, which promotes collagen synthesis, as well as uh, regulating uh, um, uh, metalloproteinases. So in essence, modulating the the breakdown of uh, the extracellular matrix as well as it's remodeling too all these areas come together in theory at least could mean that these peptides complement each other so if you've got you know stubborn tendon injury or a micro tear in ligaments then th these these connective tissues tend to be low in blood supply so if you're increasing vascularization then you've got to increased collagen at deposition as well as like increased growth in that area, then that, that could mean that, th that that injury speeds up. And faster healing is great, you know, if you're an athlete, but you know, you've got more cell migration, but then you know, the other part of it, angiogenesis, which is all stimulating the formation of those new blood vessels, that is a double-edged sword because that if you've got little micro tumors that can speed up growth. And I'll come back on some biomarkers to track that can give you some peace of mind for preventing it in the first place. But first, let's look at some anecdotal reports with the GLOW stack. So uh, one uh, interesting uh, one on Reddit was someone that had a foot injury. They're a manual worker and it just wasn't recovering. And so they did it pretty intensive doing it uh, like one milligram of both the BPC and one, uh, 157 and TB500 in this blend and then five milligrams of GHKCU. And within four days, they were able to, they, their, their ankle actually healed the tendonitis, you know, the Achilles tendonitis, but yeah, and then they're working very, very hard. And it, yeah, over that even four days, it healed and they're able to work and it didn't hinder it. And so, yeah, that is quite an intense cycle of it, just doing it over that short period as copper toxicity becomes a factor if you're doing that longer term. I mean, a vial of it, doing it that dose, you generally, you'd have used it up within 10 days. And so I'll come back onto that with dosing, but someone I did deal with with a torn ACL and they were on um, hardcore painkillers and within two days, they were, they were doing all these peptides individually, but uh, the BPC-157 in the actual knee area and within two days, they're able to come off that uh, the pain medication, at least the harder stuff. And for myself, I've had surgery on my jaw before and with the, even within five i think it was six days my body had actually built up a physical addiction it was coding for myself and then that actually after that sixth day i actually felt really really bad like a flu-like symptoms like body aches from just withdrawals from it so being able to come off um, these opiate medications faster is definitely a plus and codeine is quite a mild painkiller some of these synthetic opiates can have very bad withdrawals the pain from it can be comparable to the actual injury or surgery and there's obviously there's all kinds of other side effects as well so moving on to dosing a typical dose of it you know, people do it generally it's around that 30 day period so it'd be like the, that vial i mentioned would be like 50 milligrams of ghkcu so you're doing that if you're doing two milligrams a day that's the higher end of the dosing protocol some people do go higher with it but as I mentioned about copper toxicity, and so that's where if you don't want to do like a copper blood test midway through the cycle to make sure you're not overdoing it, then it's safe just to uh, keep it within that threshold. And so that means doing 25 shots of it. And then that would give you 400 micrograms of both uh, BPC-157 and TB-500. And then the, another factor is with the copper, some people do get a burning sensation with it and to the point where somebody it can't actually be used. So that needs to be considered as well. 
especially if you're doing it in an area with low amounts of subcutaneous tissue. I mean, I mentioned about the foot earlier, that's, that has got just a lot of nerve endings in general. I, I've actually injected uh, peptides in my knee, like BPC-157 myself, and the knee was actually okay. I had an injury there. There's a bit of tissue under the kneecap I found that was okay. Check out our 12-month rejuvenation program where every three months we look at 225 different bar markers and get your future vitality optimised. There's even a six-month break clause if your situation was to change. And it's been a little while since I've done injections of BPC. I've done it uh, orally, but for injuries, I've got a good injury prevention protocol in general. So uh, yeah, I haven't had to do it. And but recently, interesting, my back has been getting a little sore, not from actual exercise itself, but just from like social things, having guests round and then myself being sat on a bench for long periods of time and having being hunched over a bit, poor posture and not realizing if I'm sat there for a few hours and when I get up, my back's really, really stiff. And then when you're going to the gym on top of that, that's on a weekend and then I'm back in the gym Monday to Friday. And so you're not giving that back. Uh, a chance to recover so yeah it could actually be a good call at the moment to do uh, the glow stack because uh, yeah it's been a while it's been about 60 days since I've done uh, GHKCU injections of that similar amount of time I've had off TB500 as well it happened a couple of weeks ago I got an intense massage and it went away and then it's it's come again we know with Halloween coming around and so uh, I've, I've done the massage again really intense one it does help but you know because I'm also sitting there all day at my desk talking to people leaning forward because um, yeah it can be quite intensive when I've got two screens and like a lot of data in front of me bar markers and so yeah when you're sat there for a long period of time if your posture is not great that can not help things and so uh, because I'm waiting for, I'm just about to do a new epigenetic test. And so I mentioned about some of these overlapping things, you know, like if you're worried about cancer, et cetera, then there are biomarkers you do need to really, like if you're worried about that, you do need to track these things. And so just because I'm a few days off my test, I don't have the glow stack in stock. I would, otherwise I probably would have done it regardless of the test, but yeah, it's, it's something to keep in mind is, you know, you do want to prevent these things. It's a matter of weighing up which is better. That acute inflammation, if that turns into chronic inflammation, if that lingers for quite a while, or having those overlapping areas I mentioned. You know, you've got VEGF uh, with growth factor signaling. You've got actin, cell migration. Uh, what else? Metallo matrix, metalloproteinases that uh, being modulated. And then you've got you know, like collagen upregulation as well, all these things coming together, they do overlap. And so that's where these risks come in. And so because I've got biomarkers from three months ago, I know like a good one is having, if you've got a strong immune system, very low immunosenescence, so a good amount of immunosurveillance to pick up mutated cells. So then, and the most, the strongest one to look at, I mean, it, the strongest immune marker is CD4 count, like your naive CD4 cells that shows you've got a healthy thymus gland. And so that when you look at the CD4 to CD8 T cell ratio, that's a very strong biomarker. So if that's in the 50th percentile, perfectly balanced, then that's what you want to see. Mine previously, it was really, really good. It's been... Um, in the past, it's been in the 40th to 50th percentile. Recently, it went down to the 29th, but I've seen like in blood tests in between that where I've had my lymphocytes go up again. So that's a good indication that things were going in the right direction since that late July test. Also on that immune report, my natural killer cell activity looked good. So again, for cancer surveillance, that's great to see. And then just moving away from just general biomarkers, I mean, not a lot of people are testing homocysteine, not as much as they should. A lot of uh, optimization clinics don't generally do that without asking. And so, yeah, that's something just to keep an eye on. My, mine previously was running around eight and a half. So if you keep it below nine, that shows good methylation balance, less DNA instability. So yeah, homocysteine is a good one to keep an eye on. And then if it is high, then it's, you can go down that rabbit hole working, what's, working out what's driving that. Is there some kind of B vitamin deficiency? And failing that, it's just keep an eye on even just like your methyl uh, donor 
uh, like supplier as well. So like if you're taking TMG, otherwise known as betaine, I mean, I, I supplement that just because in general, I'm at risk of having high homocysteine. I've got two copies of the MTHFR gene. So just poor methylation. And so that's why I supplement like an average just over two grams a day of TMG. And then that gets my betaine level up to like the 94th percentile. So pretty much perfect. And let's not forget chronic inflammation markers. So, I mean, homocysteine is an indication of inflammation, but on top of that, you know, you've got C-reactive protein. So, so a lot of people do high sensitivity. Obviously that will flare up if you've um, got some kind of really acute inflammation, but even just measuring it, I, I measure it like uh, epigenetically to give me a longer trend of it. And yeah, IL-6 as well, keep an eye on that. And then just uh, other obscure biomarkers like mitochondrial function markers. Mine were looking not too bad back in late July. So DRP1, that just shows a balance when it's low, like a balance between fission and fusion dynamics of mitochondria. And so mine needed to come down from the 75th percentile. I've been doing things to improve mitochondrial morphology. So hopefully that's improved. And then it gives me more of a gateway, like an indication that I can use the glow stack without feeling worried about it. You know, those overlapping regeneration areas. Uh, what else is there? ETF alpha. Mine was out of balance, but I think I, I worked out that I had an issue with fatty acid oxidation, like you know, B2 and B5 deficiency. So that should be fixed. And then that's better fuel, like long chain fatty acids applied to mitochondria, better, you know, electron transport, uh, better flow through that. And then on that subject, you've got uh, ATP5B, and that wasn't looking bad at all at 45th percentile, so that can just show inefficiencies in ATP generation. It's a case of keeping these balanced as much as you can, as well as just oxidative stress markers. And as, as I mentioned, you know, acute inflammation is, is one thing short term, but chronic inflammation is not good. So if you're speeding up healing in that area, if you're uh, accelerating angiogenesis, actin, you know, like remodeling, you know, that cell migration in that localized area for a short period of time. You know, I think that there are risks to it, but I think over a short period of time, I'm not that concerned. I think it just depends on everyone's physiology is different. And so it's just trying to support your biology as much as you can, your lifestyle. If you're training hard, if you're an athlete, or if you've got a physical job, then uh, you know you have to weigh up everything together. And so, yeah, if my back issues, if they do linger, that's where I, I think I, I might look at doing the glow stack and give you an update on it. And the company I've been getting a lot of my peptides from recently is Peptides of London. I've been getting to know the, the, the owners of it and like quality is at the forefront of their brand. They really want clinical grade peptides that they stock. And so I'll be keeping an eye on any, any testing coming out, any independent testing they're doing with Jano Schick. So if you like that video, then check out this one on, I mentioned about GHKCU. So you can even do it as a topical solution. And so this is me making my own formula because a lot of people think that GHKCU, like doing injections of it, you know, you're not going to see that much for the skin, at least in like regeneration of the skin, maybe as a preventative thing, but not to repair actual like help with uh, wrinkles that have already started to form. Thanks for watching. See you next time.